Um, I sense there's a few uh, new folks here. If you've just joined us this week, um, we are in part two of a tiny little series uh, on the gospel. If that's a word you're unfamiliar with, uh, when we say gospel, we just mean the good news that was proclaimed to us uh, by God and comes to fruition in Jesus Christ. The good news which we are finding is a better ending, a better ending than the one that we wrote for ourselves in our own story. God created a perfect world where there was peace and harmony and where we lived in unity with him, but with the entry of sin into that story came distress and chaos into the human condition. But that wasn't the end of the story. God was not going to let sin or Satan or even us humans for that matter write the end of that story. He was going to step down to write a better ending. Jesus steps down to write a better ending to the story that we wrote for ourselves or others wrote for us. Uh, And what I want to declare is it was a better ending at the arrival of uh, Jesus' into human history and it's also a better ending in our lives today, and that proves true. Uh, So we're spending two weeks looking at two such stories, two such narratives of sin that we found ourselves in that God had to step in to rescue us out of. Uh, Those that were here last week, who remembers what we talked about last week? What was the problem and what did God do? Slavery, Slavery, yes, and what did God do? Beautiful. Love that, love that. Um, We were enslaved, but thanks be to God, he brings us into freedom, he rescues us, he liberates us. Um, And here's what we talked about. When we were enslaved in sin, Jesus Christ, the great redeemer, steps down to bring us out of the land of our slavery with an outstretched arm. And this week, we're going to look at another consequence of sin, how we were lost in sin, separated from God, but God steps in to find us, to restore us. So here's the main idea if you're a note taker. When we were lost in sin and utterly separated from God's presence, separated from God's presence, Jesus came down to come find us and restore us back home, back to the Father. And just like last week, we're going to look at this uh, threefold. We're gonna look at it theologically first. What did God do? What's his story? and get, get a sense, to get an understanding of that. So we'll survey the Old and New Testament to get a sense of the gospel. Uh, we'll then make it personal and look at what is the fruit of the gospel in our life. How does that truth affect us? Uh, and then finally, um, we'll attempt uh, with some tangible ways of being missional and inviting others into that story uh, that we love so dearly. All right? Now, if you were here last week, you'll remember that the approach that we've been taking in dealing with these Uh, sin and resolution problems is one of biblical theology. Biblical theology is simply taking one piece of theology, something about God, and tracing that from Genesis to Revelation, tracing that throughout the Bible. And as with all biblical theology, we have to start at the beginning and make our way through the story. This is one story, we all know that. This is one unified story that we gather around. It just so happens to be a really long story. One that spans across millennia and actually the end that we have not yet seen, but we will one day. Um, But it's one story. Um, That being said, there's some of you here, you've been in class all week, and you were hoping for Sunday to be a little bit of a break. and to you, I just I want to extend my deepest, deepest condolences. Uh, but at the same time, I also want to encourage you that my hope this morning is to paint a beautiful picture as best as I possibly can of this grand narrative that we find ourselves in, just so we can get a deeper appreciation for the God who goes far and wide to bring his people back home. And I really hope I can paint that story for you. Um, If you come from a Presbyterian, Baptist uh, background, um, I'll give you a little bit more of an encouragement. I'm gonna talk about 10 points of history that take place in cosmic history, okay? And uh, you can, every time I I I say one, you can check it off. You know, like a good Baptist kid, you know, you got the order of service and you say, okay, opening prayer, check. Worship, check, oh, he's at the sermon, okay, it's almost coming close to the end. So maybe that's a bit encouraging to you. I'm gonna talk about 10 points of cosmic history. But as we journey through this morning, 
There's three things that I want you to pay attention to. In anything I say or in anything of scripture that we read, I want you to pay attention to any time one or more of these three concepts come up. The first is God's presence. Or you might hear it as God's dwelling, him making a home with us. Whenever you hear God's presence, God's dwelling, pay attention. Whenever you hear themes of the garden, pay attention. It's going to be very important from start to finish. And whenever you hear themes of exile, pay attention because it's going to be heartbreaking but also beautiful at the same time. Anytime you hear themes of being sent out, cast out, being removed, sent outside, exile, um, pay attention. God's presence, the garden, and exile. That sound okay? All right, let's begin. Uh, We're gonna start at creation. And we know, we know the, a little bit of the story from last week that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. Everything in it, including humans. And he looked at it all and he deemed it as good. That's where we begin, at creation. He deemed it as good. Our first parents, the first humans, Adam and Eve, enjoyed perfect harmony with their creator. They lived in unity. They lived in union. There was beautiful intimacy between them. They were in the very presence of God. And they lived in a garden called the Garden of Eden. And through this garden flowed a river that watered the entire garden. That's important because it'll, it, it, at the end of the story, we'll understand why there was a river going through the garden. But in this garden, they shared beautiful intimacy. Uh, and they lived in covenant with God. And as with any covenant, there were terms and conditions to the covenant. This leads to life, and this leads to death. And God was very clear, very explicit in the terms of the covenant. You may eat and enjoy of any fruit, any tree, any plant in the garden, just not this one tree of knowledge because in doing so, that'll result in death. Now it's important to know, it wasn't so much about the tree. It was, it was more about obedience. God might as well have just said, stay off the grass. It was more so, do you trust and obey that I am wise, all wise, all loving, all caring, and all protective? And will you trust and live in that trust and in that obedience? So it's in this garden where there was once peace that Satan enters the scene and begins to tempt them asking, did God really say that you would die if you ate from this tree? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And begins to start creating doubt, confusion, Chaos in the mind, and they succumb and fall. This is a part of the story that we call the fall, bringing the curse of sin and death upon themselves, and as a result, getting exiled out of the garden. Exiled out of the garden. Gone was that intimacy that they shared with their creator. The joy, the laughter, the peace, the harmony, the beauty of intimacy, gone. And the remaining 65 books of of, of this Bible are going to be about God making a way back home to the garden, to restore and bring back home to the garden those who under the curse of sin have been lost from the creator. But what we'll see is that in God's plan of bringing home the lost, there is a beautiful story and context that's being set up. It's not just, let's just quickly get you back into the garden. Um, let's just restore you back immediately. It is a, but it is a work of patience and consistency throughout the remaining 65 books. And we saw last week how God calls one family, one nation out of slavery to be set apart as a nation that would reflect his glory, that when others looked in, they would see God and they would see his image upon these people. And from this nation would come a savior who would one day bless the whole world, is what the prophecy says. Now bless is a really broad and generic term. It's because the blessings of Jesus, who is that promised savior, are way too vast to exhaust. Not just physical, but they are deeply eternal, spiritual, restorative blessings. But from this nation is going to come one who will bless the whole world. And this nation is meant to reflect God. And so God sets up a tabernacle, a tent, 
where his glory can dwell, he himself can dwell with people. Uh, in Exodus, uh, God tells Moses to tell the Israelites that they are to make a sanctuary, a tabernacle for me, so that I may dwell among them. He desired to be close to his people again, as almost as close as in the garden. The problem is a sinless, holy, all pure, clean God cannot dwell among unclean, impure, sinful beings. So something need to, needed to happen in order to bridge that gap between the holy and the unholy. And that's where we learn about the sacrificial system, which the entire Old Testament is all about. Now, if you're new to church, that's gonna sound a little bit weird, but here's the idea behind it, that our sin leads to death. Those are the consequences of our sin. And a temporary covering of that sin was the shedding of blood of an innocent animal because in the blood there is life. And so in order for the Israelites' sins to be covered, it's just temporary, it's just being covered, there was shedding of an animal's blood. Now I wanna, I want you, there's an interesting part that I, I need us to pay attention to. The blood of these animals was used in the sacrifice. Some of the meat of the animals was given as an offering for the priests who serve in the temple to enjoy. But what happened to the rest of the body? What happened to the rest of the carcass that was considered unclean and defiled? It was taken outside of the city because it was unclean. It was exiled outside of the city. Leviticus 4, we learn that in this system, the hide of the bull and all of its flesh, its head, its legs, its entrails, its waist, so graphic, all the, all the rest of the bull, the priest must bring to a ceremonially clean place outside of the camp and burn it. Now, pay attention, that's important when we come to Jesus. Pay attention to the fact that unclean things were taken outside of the city for the sacrifice to be burnt out there. So in the tabernacle and in the sacrificial system, God is drawing near, that's what we see, and unclean things are being exiled outside so that a holy God can take up residence. Fast forward to about a thousand years, the people of Israel are living in the land, God has blessed them, and their response is to sin and turn away from God and break the terms of the covenant, continue to get more and more and more wicked in their ways. God sends prophets out of compassion to reach out to them saying, hey, turn back, here is life, here is death, you are going down the path of death, and they don't listen. In Deuteronomy, before, God, before they enter the promised land, God sets up a covenant with them. This is what leads to life, and this is what leads to death, just like in the garden. Disobedience results in death, obedience results in blessings. Um, and one of those curses that came from disobedience was of exile, removal from the land, just like in the garden. Now land was really important to the people of Israel. It was their inheritance. It was their very identity. It was the physical, earthly address of God himself because his glory dwelt in that land, in a temple in that land. But the more they were warned, the more they continued to sin. And the writers of Chronicles and, and Kings summarize the plight of the nation of Israel in this way. All the leaders of the priests and the people multiplied their unfaithful deeds, imitating all the detestable practices of the nations, and they defiled the Lord's temple that he had consecrated in Jerusalem. But the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word against them by the hand of his messengers, sending them time and time again, for he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept ridiculing God's messengers until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. And this is how the story ends. Nebuzaradan, a captain of the guards, a servant of the king of Babylon, finally on the seventh day of the fifth month entered Jerusalem. He burned the Lord's temple, the king's palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. He burnt down all the great houses, tore down the walls surrounding Jerusalem. The story goes on to how the people were exiled out of their land into a land of suffering and slavery. Again, does that remind you of the garden? What a tragic day in history.
imagine hosting the very presence of God within your city walls, in your temple, and, 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 and your response being to just, ah, no, I want something more. I want something more delicious than the presence of God. And so exile happens. And to make things worse, the glory of the Lord that used to dwell among his people in the temple at the exile departs never to come back again. And even after 77 years, when the people are released from captivity and come back to Jerusalem and build the walls and rebuild the temple, the glory of the Lord never returns to the temple. Because God was getting ready to execute the next part of his plan. And this is where now we'll cross over from the Old Testament to the New Testament, arriving at the incarnation. That word simply means to take on flesh, to take on the carnal. And John says in his gospel in John 1.14 that the word of God, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. That's a verb form of the word tabernacle. He came and tabernacled among us, built a tent among us. God made his residence among us just as he did in the garden and just as he did at the tabernacle. The humbling thing about the incarnation is that Jesus, to whom belonged all the glory, majesty, and honor, which by the way, I loved singing that song this morning. More so, I loved looking at our young people in the front row, just giving their entire lives towards that truth. And my word to you, young people, is never stop. Never stop being in awe of how beautiful he is. Um, but that, the humbling thing is that that God, to whom all glory and honor belonged, leaves heaven, chooses to exile himself to be born in a place where animals defecate. The God of life whose breath sustains the entire world is now breathing the same breath, the same air that we breathe, which is why we sing the song, Oh, the perfect son of God in all his innocence, here walking in the dirt with you and me. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. But oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Oh, praise the son of suffering. Why did he do it? Why leave glory and exile himself? Because he wants to get closer to us than the very tabernacle. He wants to get close to us. And Jesus' mission was to bring the lost sheep home and restore them back to the Father. He does that by waging war against the kingdom of darkness that has been causing so many to get lost and separated from the presence of God, which is why every time he heals a sick person, every time he casts out a demon, every time he forgives someone's sin, it is a direct assault against the prince of darkness whose mission is to steal, kill, and destroy, and the good shepherd is taking back his flock and rescuing them. And when the time was right, he prepares himself as the ultimate sacrifice, a sacrifice that's not just gonna cover sins as as animals did, but it's actually gonna eradicate the problem of sin entirely. And so he begins to look to the cross on which he's going to die. But before he goes to the cross, he makes a quick stop at a garden it's called, in the gospel writers, they call it the Garden of Gethsemane. Is that symbolic? Perhaps. I want you to engage your imagination. One songwriter, one poet thinks of it in this way. He says, in the beginning, God made a garden. He set a place to walk with men. Before the cross, he went back to the garden, knowing he'd have those walks again. The familiar smells the memories, walking with man in the evening breeze, he went back to the garden to finish what he started. It's in this garden that Jesus begins his suffering. He's before God in agony, in turmoil, and he's asking, Father, is there any other way? Is there any other way that we can bring the lost home and restore them back? Is there any other way? No? Okay, then you're not my will, but your will be done. Let's do this. And I love the opening scene of the Passion of the Christ where Jesus is in the garden, in that turmoil, agony, in that pain. His entire humanity is bared out for us to see 
And as he's praying, a serpent approaches, which is supposed to represent Satan. And the serpent approaches, hoping to maybe bite him or throw him off of his plan and disorient him. And Jesus gets up and stomps the head of the serpent. Stomps the head of the serpent. And this is Mel Gibson very appropriately interpreting imagery from the garden. Because it was in the garden that the serpent first arrived. And God curses the serpent, saying that there's gonna be enmity between your offspring and the woman's offspring. This is the first promise we have of a Messiah who's going to deliver us from this problem of sin. And he says to the, to, to the serpent, to Satan, that you will strike his heel, meaning you're temporarily gonna injure him, but he will crush your head, meaning he's going to completely annihilate you. Well done, Mel Gibson. After the garden, we come now, we come now, I, I, right, as soon as the garden finishes, we come now to the intense suffering, arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. The God of all creation is publicly humiliated, mocked, treated unfairly with no proper trial, spat upon, abused in all manner, stripped, whipped to the point of death, and made to carry his cross outside Jerusalem, outside the city. Remember I told you to pay attention to this concept of the unclean things being taken outside of the city to be burned. The writer of Hebrews um, summarizes the sacrifice system in this way. He says, for the bodies of the animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are to be burnt outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing his disgrace. Calvary, the hill on which Jesus died, even today is located outside of Jerusalem. And this is very intentional symbolism. As Protestants, we miss the tradition that the Catholics have of observing the stations of the cross. And the writer of Hebrews invites us saying, look at the only sinless man with no filth of sin, no uncleanliness on him, the only man without sin carrying the filthy sins of the entire world and making a trek outside the city to remove our uncleanliness. The perfect, sinless Lamb of God being exiled outside the city, giving up his life so that we can have life. And after dying, the friends of Jesus take down his body and bury him in a nearby tomb. Now in John's account of Jesus' burial and resurrection, he states a really interesting random fact. It almost feels like it doesn't belong. It feels like it's a waste of ink. It feels like a very unnecessary detail. But this is what he says in John chapter 19. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it. They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby. So John is saying, guys, there, there was a garden where he died. Oh, okay, John. Um, and, then, and then he was also buried in a garden. Oh, okay, John, sounds good. Oh, and by the way, when he rose to life, it was in the garden that Mary mistook him to be a gardener. Okay, John, we get it. You're obsessing about the garden for whatever reason, have a new obsession about the garden. Oh wait, are you trying to tell us something? Because if you remember, the garden is where all crap hits the fan in the most cosmic sense of the word. <laughs> that happens in the garden. It's in the garden where Satan thought he had the final word, but God's the one with the ink. And God writes a better ending in the burial and resurrection of Jesus. And now, the story is not finished yet, but this is certainly the most thrilling, the most exhilarating, the climax, the highest point of the story because it's in the garden that the power of sin and death is broken when the savior of the world gives up his life so that sins are paid for. And he comes back to life to put a seal on that promise, on that work. Susie Silk, a pastor from New York City, she draws this striking parallel, blew my mind. I'm so curious if it'll blow yours. She says, the garden is where a woman was deceived by Satan and through her, terrible news goes out to the entire world. Now in this garden, through a woman who used to be formally oppressed 
by seven demons of Satan and Jesus rescues her, in this garden and through this woman, the best news in the world is going to go forth. Jesus undoes the curse of Eve. We're getting closer now, pun intended. We're getting close to the end of the story, but also God is drawing closer and closer because we're now at Pentecost. After his resurrection, Jesus spends about 40 more days uh, presenting himself as proof to witnesses that he did indeed rise from the grave and proclaiming the kingdom of God before ascending back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father where he rightly belongs when all authority and glory and honor and majesty. And earlier in his life, he prepared his friends saying, I must leave so that another can come, a helper, my very spirit, will be closer to you than what I am even now. So about a week later, when his disciples and others and friends are are praying in the upper room, he sends his very spirit, breathes upon them to come and dwell, for his spirit to dwell in believers, not around, in. Now again, if you're new to church or Christianity, that sounds really strange, but that is God saying that I want to be closer to my children than the tabernacle. And even closer, if possible, from the 33 years of ministry that Jesus had walking with people. I want to be even closer than that to all of my children. I want to be the very breath that they breathe, the very energy that drives and sustains them. I want to be one with my people. This, my friends, is God making a home in us. But in this world, there's still separation. While sin and death have been conquered, they still have a temporary grip and control over our lives. But it's this very spirit of Christ that empowers us, convicts us, transforms us, gives us strength for this hour, gives us strength for this day, is strengthening us until that day when sin and death and Satan will be no more. In the new creation, when the war finally comes to an end, Satan, sin, and death will be completely destroyed. And after that, there will be a new city that will dominate the entire earth, full of God's glory with his people. John, when he sees a picture of that city, this is what he says, then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. That's that same word, tabernacle. God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. He, they will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, Behold, I'm making everything new. I'm making everything new. We were once lost and separated from God's presence. He is now going to dwell with us and tabernacle with us. The barriers to God's presence that were caused by sin have now been conquered by the Lamb of God who gives up his life to pay for that sin so that you can dwell with God and he with you. And that's the end of the story, my friends. And in this new city, there's a garden. Just as a river flowed through that first garden of Eden, in this new city also, John says there is a garden. He says, then he showed me, the angel, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. The story began in the garden, where Adam and Eve enjoyed beautiful intimacy with their creator. The story ends in the garden where the lost are found and we are restored back to that pure intimacy that our first parents enjoyed in the garden. 
and we will never be separated again. The end of Revelation says that nothing unclean will ever enter that city again. The serpent will never lead us astray and separate us ever again. The lamb has done it. He has done it. And that's the gospel of restoration. And the band can come up now. Um, We looked at the theology of the gospel of restoration. We looked at what did God do? What's his story? What did he do to change the ending, to write a better ending of the story than the ones that we wrote for ourselves? But we know that this is not true just of Adam or Eve or the Israelites, but each and every one of us. This is true of us. We were all lost in sin, separated and exiled from the presence of God, but Jesus steps down to write a better ending to come find us, to bring us home, and to restore us back to the Father. He is our good shepherd. And I want us to take a few moments and reflect on this personally. Uh, Last week, what we did was we created some space, and last week it was easy for most of us, might have been hard for some of us, but for most of us it was easy to think about personal ways in which we were enslaved to sin. This week it might be a little bit tougher maybe a little bit harder, a little bit less tangible. It's hard to picture, right? Because slavery comes with certain demonstrations, but being separated from God, that might be a little bit harder to understand or experience or maybe even be aware of. So how about this? If you, if you will, for a moment, close your eyes with me and try to think of a time in your life when you were physically lost. It doesn't have to be anything spiritual. You were physically lost. Maybe think of a time when as a child you were lost, because as a child, being lost has drastic implications. Because you're so dependent that being lost means that the world is ending. Can you think of such a time? I remember it so clearly in my life and just the darkness that I felt being separated from my parents. And I'm curious if you can. Do you remember that darkness, that anxiety, that uncertainty? Am I going to be okay? Is this the end? Is there any hope for me right now? Do you remember that? You can go ahead and open your eyes. I'm not trying to play with your emotions, but I want to use that experience as a parable to translate a physical reality into a very real spiritual reality that you may or may not be aware of. If you've never looked at the state of your soul as being lost or separated from God, I want to bring that to your attention. Because that was you, that was us before Jesus, completely lost, completely hopeless. And there was no way to return to God unless Jesus made a way back home. One of his friends, Thomas, asks him, Lord, show us the way home. Show us the way to the Father. And he says, I, I am the way. I am the truth. You can count on it. It's verified. It is accurate. And I am the life. I am the way back home the Father. So I want to say, come home, O wanderer. The Father welcomes you. You may have been searching and searching and searching for some semblance of belonging, for some semblance of being back home. Maybe you thought a job would do that for you, but maybe it didn't. Maybe you thought education might, but that failed to do so. Maybe you thought meeting someone and getting married might fulfill that sense of belonging, but that didn't do it either. You may have even thought being part of a church or attending a church or being part of a community might do that for you. But if you look around, we're just a bunch of broken people longing for the same thing. Find your belonging in the arms of a loving father. Find it in the arms of, he welcomes, he welcomes you home because in his presence, there is fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. In his presence, There's life, there's belonging, and he's waiting, literally on the edge of his seat, waiting with arms wide open for you to come home. 
Jesus in Luke 15 tells three stories. One of a shepherd who loses one of his hundred sheep. Then he tells a story of a woman who loses one of her 10 coins. And then a father who loses one of his two sons. And each time, each story, a pursuit ensues. The shepherd is not content with just 99 sheep. He goes far and wide to find the one lost sheep. That's God. The woman's not not content with just nine coins. She upends her entire home, throws everything up into the air to find the one lost coin. That's God. And the father's not happy with just one of his two sons. He goes to the edge of his city, humiliating himself to embrace and welcome back his lost son. That's God. And each time they find what was lost, there's overwhelming joy. He wants you to return home. Now don't get caught up in the specificities specificities of the pursuit. Does does God chase us down or do we go back to him? Now whether, whether, whether God is the shepherd who runs far and wide to grab you by the hand moments before you plummet to your death, or whether he brings repentance into your heart to lead you back home, it's all him. Just respond without delay. Return to the Father, because he's waiting. Now, I would end the sermon here, but I just cannot. We learned that last week that we were enslaved, but now free. This week we learned that we were lost, but Christ finds us and brings us back home to the Father. There's a purpose to this, my friends. The nation of Israel was set free from slavery so that they could be a light to the nations. The lost are restored back to God, adopted into his family so that they can invite others into that family. And I want you now to take a moment and think of somebody in your life who does not know this God who sets his people free and who does not know this God who runs far and wide to find his lost sheep and bring them back home. Take a moment, who comes to mind? I can think of one dear friend of mine. And I wanna encourage you, take some, some things that we learned last week and this week. We wrote some things down last week on a piece of paper. You may have taken some notes this week. Get an appreciation for the story. So you're not faking it, but get an appreciation for what did God do? What has he done in your life? And who is he calling you to reach out to with that story? Now, you don't have to retell the entire story. You don't have to recite the entire theology of it, but God did something in your life, did he not? You have a story that is shareable, is it not? Share that story. It could be getting coffee with someone you haven't in a really long time. It could be taking some things you wrote down last week and forming that into a letter. Maybe writing a letter about your story of someone you haven't talked to in a really long time and just say, hey, I just want to write some things down um, and want to share with you what God did in my life. Would you do that? Would you even consider doing that? It might be awkward, but these are just some ideas. Maybe come up with your own ideas. What are you going to do about the story that we've been soaking in the past couple of weeks? Who is God calling you to share that with? Because my friends, he's worthy. He is worthy of the praise and honor of not just you, but that person on your mind. I'll close with this. This is a scene from heaven right now. This is what's taking place. Where everyone is crying out, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb of all of that. Every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them is saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let let me pray for us. Jesus, the words that come to my mind are thank you but they drastically fall short as a response of what you've done. That deep is your grace. That powerful is your work. And we just come with our thank you, our appreciation 
that you care so much for us that you wouldn't leave us in our lostness. You could have ended the human project at the fall, but no, you wanted us back and you've made a way for us to come back. Jesus, you are the way back. We give you honor for that. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. Fill us, Lord, with that story and fill, compel us, Lord, to share that story, inviting others into that family. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.